All right, we are officially live. Good evening and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are today. And I have to say that because I know that uh, our esteemed presenter is all the way on the other side of the world. Uh, you have to let us know how Japan is looking, uh, Professor Wainwright. I'm sure it's lovely this time of year. Uh, but welcome, welcome one and all to our third research lab series as a part of our niche at 20 celebrations. I will be your director of ceremonies, April Martinez. Um, and of course, I am joined here by some of my other colleagues at the Institute for Social and Cultural Research. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. It is 5 p.m. here in Belize. I'm not sure what time it is for you over there, Prof, but uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to do this wonderful presentation for us uh, this evening, this morning. Uh, in terms of where you can find us uh, this evening, we are here live on YouTube on our Institute for Social and Cultural Research YouTube page. Um, if you are trying to share that link, you can find us there. And of course, we also have the, um, the research article that is that was shared by Professor uh, Wayne Wright on this topic as well. So there are ways that we can all get this information uh, after this session if you if you need it or if you missed some of the some of the, the presentations. So I'd like to start off by asking the director for social and cultural research, Mr. Rolando Kokom, to provide us with the welcome address. Uh, Rolando, are you there? Thanks, April. Um, and thanks again to our esteemed presenter and our um, discussant, uh, Dr. Wainwright and Dr. Pinados, um, both of Um, yeah, thank you once again. And both of them are our esteemed friends at ISCR Niche. They have been engaged with us over the years. And both of them uh, are past presenters of uh, one of the first attempts of making a national symposium called the Belize Archaeology and Anthropology Symposium. And since then, been engaged with us over the years in various uh, research lectures. I'm so pleased um, at this turn of being 20 years as an institution that we can highlight uh, the work of Dr. Wainwright and of Dr. Pinados and many others um, that have been doing uh, such excellent and, and dedicated research on Belize and for Belize. And I think that's very important. Um, the years of sacrifice um, that it takes um, both personally and professionally to do uh, research in a country is very demanding. And we are very honored that that commitment has uh, withstood the test of time and, and the different uh, challenges that one encounters um, in academia and doing community research. At ISCR Niche, our goal is to uh, be one of the leading institutions that fosters research on national issues and development issues, as well as to be a champion for the safeguarding of living heritage. Um, this year, we mark 20 years of um, research, 20 years of um, institutional strengthening, and there are many challenges that remain. Um, especially when we think about indigenous peoples. Um, Dr. Wainwright uh, works and many others will uh, be very clear that the institution on a whole has not been very kind to indigenous peoples and to the indigenous struggle. But I hope and sincerely um, anticipate that that can change for the better. The Maya um, leaders and Maya communities of Southern Belize in particular have made their case uh, have they had their case validated before the courts. And that has now, in my view, triggered a response whereby we can no longer be um, ignorant or arrogant in our approach to indigenous communities. And I think um, these type of topics, giving us our overall picture of what that struggle had, has entailed, um, its success and it, its uh, remain challenges helps us to appreciate our current uh, challenges um, as, as we see in the media. Um, and there are many challenges. And um, I know uh, the good uh, professor, Dr. Wainwright, has also 
Britain and another major challenges that major challenge that is developing worldwide um, and which has to do with the Palestinian struggle. And maybe on another occasion, he can speak to us about that. Um, and then, so it's just really to honor researchers um, uh, like these two professors who have done such excellent work and many others who are out there and to get them encouraged to do more research on Belize, um, especially Belizeans at the tertiary um, sector and our educators at both the primary and secondary level. I am very pleased that we are able to mark this occasion with such an important talk and then to have this talk available for um, persons to view and listen and engage um, whenever they like uh, via um, YouTube. And so we're excited about that and we are excited um, that although our target for these talks is very small, it's we we believe that having small centered uh, group discussions are very important in nurturing the type of research that we want uh, to advance in Belize. So thank you once again um, to our dear presenter and discussant and to those who are joining us um, on Zoom um, and on YouTube both now and in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Orlando, for those wonderful welcoming remarks. I also, just before we get started, for our viewers that are on Zoom, if you were to kindly make sure that your mics are off during the presentation so that we can hear uh, both the discussant and the presenter uh, clearly, that would be great, please. And if you could write your questions down uh, for um both Professor Rain Wainwright and Dr. Penados, so that uh, we can have a, a wonderful Q&A uh, after they have both shared their remarks. So just a little bit about how we want this to go. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Wainwright and then uh, an introduction of uh, Dr. Penados. After that, they're going to uh, have a discussion uh, amongst themselves, of course, uh, tackling this very, very uh, important topic. And then we would like to hear from you, our audience here on Zoom and on YouTube, to, uh, if you have any questions and so forth uh, for our two uh, presenters this evening. So without further ado, I would like to get started uh, to introduce our first, our, our esteemed presenter, uh, Professor Joel Wayne Wright, and he is a professor in the Department of Geography at Ohio State University in the United States of America, where he studies political economy, economy social theory, and environmental change. Uh, Joel received his bachelor's uh, with honors in environmental studies from Bucknell University and his master's and PhD in geography from the University of Minnesota. He is author of over a hundred research publications, including three books. His first book, Decolonizing Development, Colonial Power and the Maya was published in 2008, where he received the James Blount Award for contribution to political ecology. His second, uh, publication is Geopiracy, which is one of my personal favorites, actually. And it is uh, Geopiracy, Oaxaca Militant Empiricism, and Geographical Thought. And that was published in 2012. And that is presently in translation for a Spanish edition to be published next year by UNAM. And Climate Leviathan. A Political Theory of Our Planetary Future, which was published in 2018 and was co-authored by Dolph Mann, which also won the Sussex Prize for International Theory. Additionally, Joel co-edited a volume entitled Rethinking Israel and Palestine, The Marxist Perspective, which was published in 2019. Uh, and he, he co-authored, he, he co-edited this with Oded Nir. And Joel has won and received a number of honors and fellowships in his in, and is the recipient of the Ohio State Distinguished Teaching Award, his university's highest award for teaching. He has been working in Belize since 1993, and we are very pleased to have him with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Professor Joel Wainwright. Professor? 
Thank you so much, April, uh, for that lovely introduction and to Rolando as well, uh, to the whole staff at ISCR and to Niche. It's really lovely to be here and kind of amazing to think at all of the accomplishments that you have had over the last 20 years. So I'm honored to be here um, celebrating your anniversary. In fact, I, I didn't really think about this before today, but it's appropriate that we're talking about this paper in particular because uh, as you can see, it's about events that were occurring between about 20 to 25 years ago. And um, well, I'll, I'll say more about that in just a moment, but um, this, this paper took a very long time for me to write. It was an especially difficult piece of research to bring to completion, uh, partly for psychological reasons. It was hard for me to write about this period of time, uh, but also because it took me a really long time to collect all of the data to conduct all of the interviews, to comb through the archives. And it, along the way, I accumulated a huge number of debts, uh, particularly to my friends and comrades in Belize who helped me out. And so I wanna start by uh, cutting to the part of the paper we usually leave to the end, which is the acknowledgements. And, and just say again, how much I really appreciate all the help I got along the way from my Belizean friends. There are far too many to name. And because of the sensitivity of the issues, it wouldn't really be entirely appropriate for me to name all the names. Uh, but I, I just wanna acknowledge that this, this kind of work that, that, that I do in general and this specific paper simply could not exist if it were not for the active collaboration with many, many Belizeans. And I'm deeply, deeply for their uh, assistance and collaboration. And I hope that uh, whatever uh, the paper contributes to Belizean studies and Belizean historiography in some way compensates for that debt. I, I want to specifically acknowledge that I dedicated this paper to two close friends, Pio Cook and Inez Cook. We lost Pio uh, exactly five years ago. So another appropriate reason for um, having this event now during Finados and um, at, it's another anniversary in a sense that we're, we're uh, living today. Um, Pio and Inez were not only um, indigenous peoples themselves, my, uh, Mopan Maya, uh, members of the community of San Antonio Toledo, they were also leaders in their own right. Uh, uh, Pio was a leader in the church and in a number of active community organizations. Um, Ms. Inez was a leader herself in her own ways in, in many respects in the community. I learned a great deal from Pio and Inez. Unfortunately, they've now both passed. And uh, they were really, really uh, supportive of me. In fact, they were like, like second parents of mine during the period that we're discussing today, 1997 to 2004. And so I, I, I lived very closely to them much of the time during those years. And then later, I would spend a lot of time reflecting on that period with them. So they're, they're, they're directly responsible for this paper. Um, they're also responsible in another sense, which is that it was Pio's passing that finally forced me to, 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 get, to get my thoughts in writing. Uh, I, I, I sort of felt that um, uh, a lot of things that he and I had been discussing over the years about this period of time, uh, could be lost if I didn't get it into writing. So um, that's another reason why it's appropriate. I, I suppose we're here today, five years later. So on with the show, let's talk about the paper. Now, I'm not going to read the paper. I'm not going to try and summarize the whole thing quickly. That would be sort of ridiculous. I'll, I'll hope that it's a very long paper, unfortunately. Um, so, I, But I, I hope that today's discussion will inspire those of you who haven't read it to, to read it sometime. But I thought it would be appropriate just to take a few minutes to summarize the main argument. So I'll do that now. So the basic of the structure of the paper is like this. In the introduction, I lay out very briefly the object of analysis of the paper. And the object, in short, is the relationship between two actors, uh, the Maya communities of southern rural Belize and the government of Belize, what I'll call the state. Now, the, the Maya and the state have a long and conflictual relationship that goes back to, of course, the colonization, first by the Spanish and later the British, of what we now call southern Belize. So this paper is an analysis of that ongoing conflictual relationship just for one specific particular period. And the method that I adopt is called the conjunctural analysis. The language here comes from the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci, who noted that if we think about it, any point in time, any present, such as the present we're in today, can be understood as an ensemble of connections between different historical processes that each have their own distinct rhythms and come together in a particular way to constitute a specific conjuncture. 
One of the reasons it's hard to get our bearings in the world at any given point in time is that it's difficult to see how all those social and historical processes that make the world up, uh, where they stand in terms of their distinct processes at any point you know, in time. So but what, what, what can sometimes occur is that after 10 or 20 or 30 years, you can reflect on a period and you can tease apart those different processes and see how they came together in a distinct way. And when we look at history that way, we start to recognize that each moment can be conceived of as a conjuncture, but that certain conjunctures are in a way more important than others because certain rhythms come together in ways that mark decisive turning points. And so the argument of this paper is that 1997 to 2004 was such a conjuncture. It was a period in this long history of colonization where it seemed like things could have changed significantly. Now, I, I should just tell you up front that at the time, because I was an actor in this process, I was uh, less, um, how can I put this? I was less confident than I am today that in fact there were opportunities for real change. So this paper reflects a change of opinion on my part, which was arrived at through a lot of time reflecting upon uh, and looking at the, the research and conducting research and looking at the data. So uh, that's the laid out in the introduction. The second part of the paper is essentially background or context where I help the reader understand what the relationships between the Maya and the state were like between independence and the period under study. And the core of the paper is section three, where I look at what happened to the relationship between the Maya and the state between the time of the 1998 election and the end of the period under review 2004. And uh, as you may re recall, in the summer of 1998, there was a national election, which the PUP won decisively. They won practically every seat in the entire country. And that was the first PUP government to come into power, which was not led by George Price. Said Musa was the new leader, and he was surrounded by some relatively young uh, leaders in his cabinet. And it was a time when there were a lot of relatively new ideas on board the new government. And some of the new ideas, not all of them, but some of them concerned Toledo. In the run-up to the election, uh, Said Musa and his team had reached out to the leadership of the Maya movement, which had been making great progress in the mid-1990s, and essentially said, like, let's sit down and see if we can work together. And the two, the two sides did make an agreement. The, for the Maya leadership, for their part, agreed to support the PUP's campaign, uh, not just abstractly or indirectly by offering solidarity to Said Musa, but concretely by putting their resources and their labor to work uh, for the PUP, including for Marshall Mess's successful run in the Toledo West District. But in return, they asked for specific concrete things from the PUP. And in particular, they asked for four things. And this was all worked out in a series of uh, memorandum and letters before the election. So in part three of the paper, I evaluate like what changed with respect to each of those four things. In the first place, you may recall there was a series of very contentious logging concessions, which had been granted by the previous UDP government, the famous so-called Malaysian logging concessions, which actually went to a Chinese firm. Uh, immediately after the election, the new government formed a new ad hoc committee to evaluate all of the existing logging concessions in southern Belize. They appointed Julian Cho to that committee, the leader of the Maya movement at the time. And that committee sat down very shortly after the election in like October, and they went through every logging concession and essentially said yes or no. And uh, they eliminated the most contentious logging concessions. So just like that, they stopped. So uh, there were many other issues surrounding logging in Toledo, which were not resolved. I think we could say the same today. Uh, but I have to say that with respect to the first issue about logging concessions, the government certainly kept its word. And in fact, I have to say that if you look at the reporting that was done and the speed with which they acted on those issues, it was very unusual, actually, for the history of Belizean politics that you get such a uh, rapid um, uh, ad addressing of grievances like that on the part of community. In the second place, uh, the, the Maya leadership made it clear to the new leaders that they, they needed expanded educational opportunities, especially for secondary students. Uh, it's hard to remember this, perhaps, for some of you, but as late as the mid-1990s, there were very, very few high school students graduating from the villages of Southern Belize. It was by significant margin, the least educated part of the country, particularly again at the secondary and tertiary level. So the Maya communities and through their leaders made it clear to the new government, 
we need more high school opportunities and we need especially a high school that's within uh, easy driving distance for school buses to our communities. Shortly after the election, the new government agreed to create a new high school uh, with, in consultation with Julian Cho and others, they decided to put it at a place called The Dump, which is uh, well positioned to the different rural communities. It was subsequently built. Unfortunately, it was opened after the death of Julian Cho, but it was named in his honor. Julian Cho Technical High School is now, unless I'm mistaken, the largest high school in Southern Belize. More generally, there were some expanded opportunities across the district. Among those was the creation of the Tumul Kin School, which my uh, my friend and comrade, uh, uh, Dr. Panados can speak to better than me. He was the director of the school for several years. To be clear, the government of Belize did not create Tumul Kin. Tumul Kin was really a product of the hard work of communities and leaders like Dr. Panados. But what I would note is that the government of Belize at this time did not try and stop the creation of Tumul Kin. They, they got out of the way, so to speak, and they're to be credited, I think, for that. As a result of these initiatives, the number of students coming from rural Maya communities going to high school skyrocketed in the next 10 years, a faster increase than I think we've seen in any other part of Belize since independence, approximately tripling in about 12 years, the number of high school graduates. Very impressive. So here again, I have to say, for all the problems that still exist in education, if we ask the question, did the government fulfill its uh, promise? I think the answer has to be yes. In the third place, the Maya leadership wanted economic development for their communities. They wanted finance. They wanted money to flow into their communities to create jobs, to pave roads, and the like. And the government tackled this in a series of ways. They promised the completion of the paving of the Southern Highway, which was a very contentious issue, uh, one that the Maya leaders were not enthusiastic about. In fact, we tried to stop the financing of the paving of the Southern Highway. Uh, long story, I would be happy to discuss if you're interested. It's touched on in the paper. The government also opted to create two very different development projects. One was called the Community Assisted Agriculture and, and Resource Development Project, or CARD for short, uh, Integrated Rural Development Project in short. Additionally, they wanted to create a new public development corporation, which they did legally create called the TDC. In this section of the paper, I try to briefly evaluate the consequences of those two projects. Simply put, they both had lots of problems. Uh, but CARD was the more successful of the two, I think. And uh, at the time, I worked with CARD for about two months, and I, I wrote a few, I've written a few things about these projects along the way. But I'll simply say that for reasons I'd be happy to elaborate on, but I won't digress now, these projects left a lot to be desired, and they didn't really deliver concrete gains for many people in the district. But what is notable is that when you sift back and you look at the evidence on poverty and inequality in Belize, which we were only able to do after this government, the one under discussion, uh, sponsored the two uh, only uh, uh, studies of poverty in Belize that have ever been done that were really high quality. It's noticeable that in the 2000s, Toledo was the only part of Belize that saw a significant drop in significant poverty. I, I, so in sum, for all the problems of these development projects, they did contribute to the significant decline in poverty that occurred in Toledo and did not occur in any other part of Belize. So Toledo in this period, we could say in retrospect, was essentially brought into the economic life of Belize more fully. And uh, that wasn't exactly what the my leaders wanted in 1998, but it's what they got. So it was kind of a mixed, mixed result. Even more mixed and more contentious is the fourth point. The Maya leaders clearly wanted official recognition that they have indigenous rights to land as communities. Now, we all knew that this was going to be the most difficult of the four uh, issues for the new government to tackle. And at the time, frankly, I, I didn't think the government was really trying at all. But the evidence suggests that, in fact, there were significant attempts made on the part of the government to address the issue of indigenous uh, land rights. For instance, I, we all, I think, are aware that in 2000, they signed something called the 10 Points of Agreement that led to at least the preliminary recognition of land rights. But the story that you all know, of course, is that subsequently the two sides ended up back in court. That went to the Supreme Court, where Conte made his terrific decision in favor of indigenous land rights, subsequently reaffirmed at the Court of Appeal, all the way to the CCJ in the 2015 uh, consent order. And that brings us to the present day. But what's often forgotten, and bring this back out, is that in, I hear a dog, Some, somebody objects to what I'm saying. 
What's often forgotten is that in the immediate wake of the 1998 election, that is to say before the lawsuits, there was an attempt by the two sides to sit down and negotiate these issues in good faith. In fact, as quickly as October 1998, just a few months after the election, Musa had appointed a point person to work with Maya leaders to work out the terms on which the two sides were going to negotiate. And the terms were pretty good. And the Maya leaders were pretty happy about how things were going. The talks themselves were called the friendly settlement talks. And in case, and it wasn't missed any of us at the time, but Said Musa, who as many of you know is a Palestinian lesion, when he went to the UN General Assembly and gave his first inaugural lecture uh, or, or statement as the Prime Minister of Belize, rhetorically linked the struggle for Palestinian self-determination with the struggle for indigenous people's self-determination and beliefs. It's pretty remarkable. That wasn't something that those of us who were active at the time were pushing him to do. That was something he did voluntarily. But now, of course, we could say like, well, maybe, maybe he was just being rhetorical. You know, it's easy to make those gestures. But then why did they appoint the committee and sit down and negotiate the terms by which they were going to work out in good faith, in theory, how to recognize indigenous land rights? Unfortunately, though, uh, shortly, in fact, just a week after they worked out the terms for the talks, Julian Cho died. And in the immediate wake of Julian's passing, a lot of things changed on the Maya side. There was a kind of vacuum of leadership. And what was worse, there were many people who were pointing fingers at one another about who was responsible for Julian's death. It was a very difficult time. And it's still hard for me to talk about, actually. But uh, to make a long story short, it meant that during the crucial six-month period that followed, the first half of 1999, when the two sides could have been using the momentum from the recent election, their partnership, their success, the fact that they had established a certain rapport because of the logging concessions issue and the educational opportunities that were starting to flow, rather than sitting down and thinking creatively and saying, how can we change the relationship between the government and the Maya communities? How can we work out an agreement where you can collectively own your lands and resources but nonetheless still remain Belizeans within the sovereignty of the nation state of Belize, et cetera. Instead of seeing those opportunities for breakthrough, we essentially saw stasis and then the negotiations basically fell apart. And in the, in the wake of the breakdown in negotiations, which it's a complicated story, it took, in, took place in two phases, first 1999 to 2000. And then there was a kind of replay three years later when Assad Schumann was appointed by Said Musa to come in and try and kickstart the negotiations. In, in the midst of all that, there was a change first in the individuals essentially leading the movement and then in the form of leadership. It was a complicated time. You can read the paper if you want the details. But in sum, we know what happened, which is that the negotiations failed and the two sides ended up in court. And once you're in court, then you're opposing one another formally. And then the theory was that once the Maya win land rights, then they work out a new agreement. And in a sense, that's where we are today. So this paper is intended to kind of help us remember the prehistory of the present conflict. Sadly, today, it seems to me, uh, the, the situation where we could hope to see an agreement by the two sides is much more difficult than it was in 1998 to 1999, even though we have the consent order to provide the legal framework to do so. So in sum, uh, after going through this uh, balance sheet type of analysis, I have a discussion which leans heavily on a pair of interviews I conducted with the former prime minister, Said Musa, who I'd like to thank again formally for sitting down with me and, and talking, as well as Assad Schumann, who he appointed to be the point person for the second round of negotiations. I'll just note in passing, I have at one time or another, because as Rolando said, I've been working in Belize for a long time, I have formally requested interviews with every prime minister, except Johnny Briseño, uh, some, in some cases on more than one occasion. Said's the only one who's agreed to sit down and, and have an on, on the record interview. And I, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I, particularly because I'm someone who criticized Said Musa a lot over the years. And uh, it wasn't just an interview, as you can, you can judge for yourself. I mean, it was a real back and forth. He really engaged. And I really appreciate that. And so I just want to say thanks again to Said Musa. Um, I wish that I wish that more political leaders around the world uh, were so willing to sit down with scholars 10, 20 years after the fact and really get into the nuts and bolts. We would all be better off. We'd have a better understanding of how government works and so forth. So I just want to put in a plug then for other former prime ministers of police um, and other Belizeans, you know, uh, just because someone leaves office, like stay on them, try and get those interviews because they're worth a lot. Uh, at any rate, you can 
um, you can see the analysis there, but I'll just read a few lines from the conclusion to wrap up and then turn this over to Filiberto. So uh, if I may, this, this is the summation of the whole argument. I have to move us here. All right, so after the 1998 election, the Maya communities in Belize were closer than most, including me, thought to a breakthrough in transforming their relations with the state. Yet the lands department stymied change within the government. The state's development strategy introduced new challenges for the communities, Critical weaknesses of the movement were revealed after Julian Cho's death and economic conditions, which that was the biggest boom in the history of Toledo since independence, uh, were not favorable for agrarian based resistance. After the two sides failed to build trust or momentum in the 1999 talks, the opportunity passed. The aperture closed. Subsequently, the Maya returned to the courts to improve their bargaining position, hardening divisions. Two decades on, the Maya have won legal rights to their ancestral lands, but have been unable to change the underlying political and economic relations. And the majority of households today who produce their own livelihoods on lands of uncertain tenure treat maize milpa farming as a secondary economic activity. And their primary goal now is to sell labor power via migration. There's a part of the paper which tries to emphasize how political and economic changes that have occurred make today's situation significantly different than it was in the 1990s. But I think that's enough. Over to you, Filiberto, and thank you all for your attention. I hope you in, enjoyed reading the paper, if you did. Thank you, thank you, uh, Joel, very much. Um, and I really think that for our Zoom audience that has joined us, um, thank you guys so much for, for tuning in this evening. Um, I'm pretty sure that we will have a link to the article in the chat box for anybody that wants to, to read it. And um, I hope that you all have been jotting down your questions for uh, Dr. Wainwright. And so once we get into that Q&A session, don't go away. Um, but without further ado, I would like to introduce our second presenter and discussant for this evening, our very own Dr. Filiberto Panados. Dr. Panados is an associate professor and the research director at Galen University. His work focuses on indigenous and critical education and development. He has taught and published on these subjects, including, including a recent book, a Beginner's Guide to Building Better Worlds, Ideas and Inspirations from the Zapatistas. And this was co-authored with uh, Levi Gaman and other colleagues. And his other publication was Class Processes and Agrarian Change in Southern Belize from 1981 to 2020. This article was co-authored with Henry Peller and Joel Wainwright in the Journal of Peasant Studies. His experiences include establishing Tumulkin Center of Learning and servicing as and serving as an advisor to indigenous movements in Belize and Central America. He's certainly no stranger to us here at Mitch, and he and having presented on multiple occasions at our conferences and lectures, including a public lecture available on our ISCR Niche YouTube channel entitled Belizeanizing History, Decolonizing an Independent Belize. So please do check that out if you haven't already. And without any further delay, we now have Dr. Pinados to provide his remarks and discuss them with Dr. Wainwright. Dr. Pinados. Thank you, April. Um, and good afternoon, everybody, and good morning, Joel. Uh, first of all, thank you, Joel, for writing this article and presenting it here today um, for a number of reasons that you mentioned, you know, the, the, the fact that um, the ISCR of Nietzsche is celebrating its 20th anniversary and also anniversary of Pio, but also I think because it kind of honors uh, the work of Julian Cho. Uh, I don't think that there's much that has been written about Julian. And so I think it's it's great to have a glimpse at the at the work that he did. I mean, today I think everybody knows about William Cho because of the high school and because also of the organization down in Toledo, the Julian Cho Society. So I think for those reasons, it is it is fantastic that you did that today, and I'm I'm grateful for it. Um, 
so just for uh, the audience, so I have been in Toledo for quite some time as well. It kind of it occupies a lot of my head and heart space, let's say. And uh, in a sense, I, I came to Toledo around uh, 2000, 2001. So shortly after that aperture had uh, closed, <laughs> um, Joel, um, uh, right kind of at that, at that moment. And um, I have worked in a variety of capacities in a variety of ways in, in Toledo. And um, I really came there, I think, because in a sense for me, uh, what was happening in Toledo, um, aside from the fact that, you know, of course I have an affinity to the Maya struggle being of my ancestry myself, but I think what was most uh, interesting and important was that it seemed like a place of struggle. I mean, a, a, a place, sorry, a place of promise, of a lot of promise, right? Um, if you're looking for any decolonial project in Belize, I think that that's kind of where uh, you would find it. I, I, I didn't think that there was any place where there was a real decolonial uh, project uh, in, in, in Belize. And, and so it seemed to be really important to be involved in. And I have learned a tremendous deal from, from the experience there. And uh, over the years, of course, I've also kind of struggled to understand what's going on. And as you write, how do we move things uh, forward? Um, and I think, especially in light of the current uh, situation, there's a lot of talk in the air about decolonization as uh, Belize engages in the reform of the constitution. I think this also uh, can, can be a relevant paper to talk about. Okay. But anyway, I wanted to share some of my thoughts. Um, they're kind of a little bit all over the place. They always are. I don't know if ever I can think clearly, but uh, I mean, in any case. So I, I, I get it that, um, you know, in your presentation, you were talking about, you know, the, there's a conflictual relationship between the Maya from the beginning. And there's this period here where it seems as if the relationship between the state and the Maya is transformed. And in a sense, that the Maya land rights question, in a sense, is, is resolved. And um, it's interesting that you said that at the moment, right, you didn't necessarily think that, you weren't as, as confident that was the case. And I think that's a very interesting point because for everybody who's engaged in a struggle, um, how, do, how do we transcend and are able to see that there are some possibilities? And that's something that I think that really struck me about the paper. And I'm thinking, how can I, how, how can I apply that? How can I apply that to the current moment? And I think it is important for, for anybody that's engaged in social transformation. So what I understand is that this kind of moment uh, pregnant with possibilities, um, you know, arose because of a number of actors, uh, Assad, Saeed, new elections, a number of things, uh, Kulian, who was working in, in, in Toledo. Um, but in a sense, it sort of uh, failed. Right, that's kind of the way that you 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 put it. It was interesting the point that the four things that uh, the PUP promised and in a sense accomplished the first three, the third one kind of right, uh, the economic development, and the one where really failure happened was the question of land rights. Okay, and I was thinking that here's my sense. Thinking okay, the first three actually. And as difficult as it might be, and as important as it might be, the achievement might be, I do feel, like you said, that the question of land was the most critical. And I know at some point you said, you know, if the PUP had remained in power, Julian had been kind of alive, perhaps the results would have been different. I think I'm a less optimistic than you are <laughs> in terms of that, um, in the sense that you say, well, why did it fail? Well, internally in the, in, the, in the government, right, there were divisions, but there wasn't agreement actually on the question of land rights. And on the Maya side as well, there was no, there was some division, some distinctions as to how to uh, manage and steward that land. And so to me, really the essence of decolonization is the question of land. <laughs> so I, I sort of like, would like to hear more of your thoughts on, on, that, on that question. Because if you think about it, when the Maya demand land, they are one, they're talking about collective land rights, or at least some elements of the land rights movement and uh, was articulated in that manner, which is so different from the idea of private property. So it really tackles the core of capitalism, right? If you, if you want, the idea of private property. For that reason, um, I think it's, it, it seems to be really challenging 
um, because it's talking about a different way of relating to the land, right? And the other one is that you also mentioned in the paper that, you know, post George Price, what came about was this clientelist politics, right? In which land actually played a very central role because politicians could control and give land. This threatened to take away land from the control of that. So really, if you think if the PUP was going to move this, they would have to convince their colleagues, Saeed and Asad were going to convince their colleagues. So I don't know, I feel like that really that was the core of the issue. And unfortunately, we're never, we were not able to see what would have happened, right? Because uh, Julian died and things changed. But I guess I'm a little bit more skeptical, right? Um, and I'd like to hear more about that. I think that was really an important part of the paper um, that uh, it'd be interesting to, to discuss. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting because I thought we can talk about the Maya land rights uh, struggle and kind of dissect it, but that's I'm kind of less interested in that, I guess, because it, it feels like talking about the third person. Right? <laughs> but um, but I do feel one very important point there that I, I well, at least one important point that I thought was that you speak about how the Maya uh, really, you know, presented an affront to colonial capitalism. But in a sense, it kind of remained there, like it didn't resonate, it didn't transcend to the larger kind of nation of Belize. And one could say, well, you know what, the Maya people didn't, haven't quite spent enough time educating others and all of those things and kind of, it, it's, they should have done none of that. But I'm kind of interested, why has it not moved beyond? Okay, and yes, in, and in a sense you're saying, well, you had Said and Assad in the PUP, and but it seemed that it felt in, in fact right now I mean the tensions seem to kind of go back to the very kind of uh, uh, situation. So that's the other thing that kind of emerged for me. Um, I guess this is related to another point. We talk we talk about how for some in, I think you use the term radical uh, utopian, right? Um, that one argument would be say, well, you know what, Said and Assad are not quite socialists, and uh, you know they were not serious. Um, the question of a socialist or a left in Belize is something that, you know, uh, it raises the question for me. You kind of made just a statement and moved on. And of, I know the paper wasn't dealing with this, but I think that is really interesting, right? Um, and then I guess the last point I wanted to make is that one of the issues that emerges also is that you see what he pointed out, that the Maya have gone to the court won several cases, but yet it hasn't really changed things on the ground. So the limitations of the courts, of a legal strategy. And I raise that because right now we're talking about decolonization and uh, true reform of the constitution. And I, I can, it, it's sort of like, there seems to be some connection there to what extent, you know, maybe you can speak a little bit to the limitations of, of that as well. Anyway, those were my, my, my questions, my thoughts that I, and having read the, the paper. Thank you. All Wonderful. right. Uh, Should I jump in? Yes, please. Okay. So, um, Filiberto, as always, thank you so much for your brilliant and critical responses. Um, you put a lot on the table, more than I will be able to answer to uh, in full now. So let me just let me just pick on one or two key points and give a a candid response, and then we can get on to the, the Q&A and a broader discussion. So, so the central element which I'm taking from Filiberto is a, what I would characterize as a very healthy and critical skepticism about my claim about whether we were closer than we thought at that time. And I think that's well placed. So let me just say a few things. First of all, Filiberto may be right. Uh, from, a, from a scientific perspective, he may be right and I may be wrong. And unfortunately, it's in the nature of historical interpretation that there will never be a final objective answer to this question. So let the debate continue. And I think it's an important one for all of us to, to have. Uh, but the second thing I would say is it, the, the things that Filiberto just shared with you are exactly the sort of things that I was saying myself during the years under discussion. So when I was a younger person, and I, I was saying exactly those sorts of things. I was also saying things like, I don't know why we would ever expect that this government would sit down and really negotiate on the issue of land rights, that it's not a decolonial government. It doesn't have a left wing pulling it in that direction. The movement isn't strong enough to force it. 
So I agreed with the strategy that we had to go back to the courts. It's just that after many years of reflection and sifting through the evidence, I am I I was convinced that we were closer than we thought. Now, you, you'll have to decide whether that's a valid perspective, but it isn't just about the evidence of the PUP government willingness to kind of move on a few related issues, like things that are easier, like logging or creating new schools. It also comes down to what I would characterize as the genuine commitment on the part of certain actors upon reflecting upon this period to say things that are very similar to the sort of things that you and I say, Philip. Um, and there, so yes, there were struggles on both sides within the Maya and the state that prevented the two parties from seeing through what could have been a shift in the relationship. And because of those internal contradictions, both sides fell short. So if you want to put it this way, there's blame to go around. There are other independent variables, which I gesture to briefly, like the economic boom or the 2000 election in the United States, which changed the whole orientation of the U.S. Embassy, which, as you know, is this major factor always behind the scenes in Belizean political life. But without getting into all that, here's my counterfactual for you, just to clarify what I'm trying to say. The situation today, as we all know, is one where the Maya have won legally the rights to land, but they have been unable to realize that concretely on the ground. It, that's defined by the April 2015 consent order. But what I'm trying to say is that if you look at the principle embedded in the 2015 consent order in paragraphs two, three, and four, where the government says, yes, Conte was right. There is indigenous land rights in Belize. It's protected by the constitution. We respect that the communities of Toledo hold such rights and we will demarcate and recognize those rights we will not do anything to infringe upon those rights. That principle, that statement, which incidentally we should remember was written by the lawyers for the Maya and agreed to by the attorney general in April, 2015. That is what I think we were getting close to in 1999. And I, my, the question I wanna ask is, how would Belize be different today if that principle had been worked out between Julian Cho and Said Musa and signed in April 1999, not April 2015. And the subsequent 16 years of struggle and conflict had not occurred, but had been replaced by what we're in today. What I think that would have allowed for is movement in the direction of community-based resource management, where there was a recognition of ownership of land rights in the communities, but also a recognition of the state's sovereignty in different ways in different communities. It could have worked out in, in under circumstances that would have been much more favorable to the, to the positive resolution of many of the problems we see on the ground. That's my view now. And the fact that we missed that opportunity means that now we're in a really difficult and different situation, which now here I have to acknowledge that this runs the risk of nostalgia, like, oh, if we had only one, it would be so much better. And I definitely, definitely, do not want to leave anyone with the feeling that this is all just about, you know, my objective mind producing the conditions necessary for my subjective desire for nostalgic happiness, et cetera. I don't think it's about that. I mean, this is what I struggled about when I was writing the paper. But, you know, ultimately it's for the reader to decide. But what I want to say instead is simply that this is what happened. We failed. But once, only once we recognize that we did struggle and we tried and the two sides fell short and we failed, can we really understand the present? So it's about understanding the present better that I bring this analysis to us. As for the left in Belize, yes, Filiberto, that is a broader conversation, but as always, I thank you for asking us. In a sense, the missing actor in this whole story is where were the non-Indigenous, non-Maya, non Belizean left-wing actors struggling for decolonization and justice in Toledo during this period? Another factor that could have changed all of this would have been some protests outside the lands department in, in 1999 or 2000, saying respect indigenous rights to land, respect all Belizeans rights to land, right? I mean, had there been a social uprising of the sort that we associate, for instance, with the late 19th century labor struggles or gender struggles in the post-colonial period, if we, if we think about it, like there have been moments when the, what, what, what is essentially the left in Belize had, has stood up for not only their own rights, so to speak, but for a different Belize. And had such an actor been constituted effectively in this period, then that could have also changed things, but it, it, it didn't happen. So that's, we have a lot of work to do. Why don't I stop there and uh, we can turn it over to 
the floor. Thank you. Would you like to counter that, um, Dr. Panados, before I get into the Q and A? No, I, I don't think so. And I think I think um, really I think we should. Be, I'd love to hear the the question and answer. I, I think um, I've asked these questions because um, as Joel and I have talked about some of these issues. Um, the last slide that you have there, um, and Joel, the Maya struggle is a Belizean struggle. Um, that's the point that I'm particularly kind of very interested in discussing, you know, and continuing to discuss right? the last point that you made. Anyway, thank you. Wonderful. All right. Um, it seems that we do have some very eager um, participants that are waiting to ask uh, some questions right now. And so just before I get into, into the Q&A segment, if any of our participants that are in the chat right now would like to uh, raise their hand and ask it uh, verbally to either Dr. Wainwright or Dr. Fanatos, you can do so. Uh, if not, I can read it from the chat box that is here uh, at the moment. But yeah, I also saw that uh, Christina Cook had her, her hand up. And I also believe um, there is a question here by Juan Cal. So uh, uh, Christina, your hand was up. I'm not sure if you're there. Okay, so I will open the floor to Juan, who has his mic and his video on. Good, good evening, Juan. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I have a very, uh, a very important question because we, we're currently seeing the recent headlines and how my people are being demonized because they are uh, struggling to um, safeguard their rights to their land. My question to you, to to both of the panelists, is that. Why do we, why do Belizeans on the whole continue to demonize the Maya land rights? That is my question. Billy, you want to take that first? <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, well, I think in my in my view, I mean, it has to do with the first question that I raised uh, uh, with Joel, um, that I feel the question of land, land rights, really calls into question many things, right? Um, for example, if the Maya people are indigenous peoples to Belize and they have rights to this land, then the identity of other arrivals, so to speak, is, is challenged, right? Uh, how, how, do, how can, say, for example, the Kuru population make a claim uh, to be from Belize, right? It's not that they aren't from Belize, they are from Belize, don't get me wrong, right? But in terms of like how we identify, how do we, we construct our identity, that's calling the question. Uh, the same thing for the Garifuna. So that obviously, I think, calls into question that. Um, to answer your talking about land as a collective right, right? And it's taken away from the state. So the state is no longer give it to anybody that wants. Um, so that's taking a lot of power from politicians, right? And, and as I said, it, it just challenges the, 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 the way that we think about relating to the land. Um, other people want the land, okay? <laughs> the man people are, are claiming. So that's another, I think, issue there. And I think the, the and maybe this is, I'm repeating myself here, but the question of clientelist uh, politics, uh, for many years, and I think across Belize, I mean, politicians are able to give land um, to other people. So this is taking away power from them. Um, and that, I think, cannot be taken lightly. Maybe I, I'll, I'll close by saying that um, I think we tend to see ourselves as enemies when the real enemy is somewhere else. Um, and I always kind of share this point. We were at an interview in Belize City at Open Your Eyes, the interviewer says, but kind of um, aren't, um, he was questioning the fact about the Maya people claiming for land and, you know, whether they just wanted a bigger piece of the pie. And so I kind of raised the question, okay, so let's say we, for example, we open the lands of Toledo uh, to be given to anybody else. Who do you think will get the land? Will it be... Uh, 
Creole man from South Sudbury City. And I think that he, he started laughing and he said, well, obviously not. So who, who will, okay? Um, and I think, so we, we might see, and so the Creole community in South Sudbury City or somebody else might see the Maya people as a real enemy, uh, but the real enemy is something else. And I think it's ultimately, it's, it's this kind of this colonial legacy, it's a political economy. So those are some of the issues I think why it leads to that, um, at least some, from, from my perspective. Joel, you want to add to that? That's a great answer, Philly. I just would add one one point, perhaps, which is that the version of Belizean history, which has prevailed, has essentially written out two to three hundred years of contact history between the Spanish and many different Maya groups. And as a consequence of this, um, most Belizeans, I think, have a very distorted or limited understanding of the depth and complexity of engagements between the Spanish and the Maya for hundreds of years. And that's not accidental. The British wanted to write all that out so that they could present their claim to the, the territory of Belize as, you know, clean, God-given, and now this is all for the king and queen, etc. And so, unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do still to decolonize that history, or if you would, just 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 reteach it and and uncover it because absent a, a deeper appreciation of that Spanish Maya history, we uh, can't really appreciate the uh, the wrongness of the prevailing historical narrative. So I'll just say we, we we have quite a bit more work to do on that front. All right, Christina um, looks like yes, she has her yes, hand up. Christina's hand is up. Um, Christina, your floor is yours. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, good morning, Joel. It's wonderful to see you and uh, Billy. Um, Joel, as I reflect on what you have presented as, um, I guess, perhaps in summary, that there was a, a very close opportunity to achieving some of the well, some of the objectives of the Maya movement at the time in the mid 1990s, I right. I pose two questions to you. Okay. One, so if if the if if Said Musa saw and maybe compared or associated the Palestinian struggle with the Maya struggle for self determination at that time, it is also important to remember that it was the very Said Musa who introduced the concept of balkanization, which has become a That's very right. divisive, up to this day, a very divisive concept among uh, ordinary Belizeans against uh, Maya people. So that's one. Two, the very death of Julian itself are in and around that same time, right? Mm. Okay, we were nearing and coming close to some kind of agreement, but then Julian was killed. Right. Right? And so you wonder, are, were we very close? And then if I reflect now, OK, so had maybe if we had signed, uh, reached an agreement, an amicable agreement at that time, Julian was still alive, the leadership continued, um, what would be a Toledo today? What would be the Maya communities today as we know it? Avoiding all the strategic litigation, uh, avoiding all the, the still the struggle that exists today. Now, we have some of those very people in government and we have some of these very, uh, the nature and the narrative that have been imposed repeating itself now in the current and in the present day. Right. Mm -hmm. And, That's right. and you, you realize that even throughout the struggle, uh, you come close, you very, you come very close, you make, you make inroads and, and then yet three steps behind right and so so this is this is the issue that there are moments in any struggle where you come you get very close now you ask the question and this is my last point okay. well how do we how do we keep hope right how do we keep believing right at that time it was difficult for you to believe that we could make any gains with that government and maybe you were looking from within and not from outside currently as a member of the of the Maya leadership and deeply involved in within internally, you know how do I how do I try to look from the outside and see where the opportunities are, mm. right? 
you have to see where the opportunities are within a struggle because otherwise, why would you continue to struggle, right? There has to be the hope that even though there is not this buildup of a social movement of ordinary Belizeans standing in solidarity with your struggle, even though that is not existing, even today it doesn't exist, right? Even though, mm -hmm. in fact, it's worse today, I think, than in the mid-1990s because of the divisions that have been planted. Yes. Even yes. though that does not exist, What's important to recognize is that so long as people are being violated, so long as rights are being violated, so long as people feel that there's an injustice, right? They will continue to struggle because for the Maya people, it is a struggle for survival. And so, so this, again, gives the reason why there has to always be hope. But of course, you know, we can't, we can't also ignore that the government's are limited even now in the present day in their understanding of, of indigenous people's rights, in their capacity mm -hmm. on standards, in their capacity on even what the decision of the Caribbean Court of Justice really means. And so yeah. um, those are my reflections. And I, I just like to hear your perspective, at least on the first two. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you, Christina. As always, it's a it's a it's a delight and a pleasure to think about these things with you. Uh, so on the first point about Said Musa going to the United Nations in 1998 and linking the Palestinian struggle to Maya self-determination, and then by 2003, 2004, using the word balkanization to basically do a kind of what we call in the United States dog whistle or race baiting, a kind of electoral strategy to signal to his voters in Belize City, like, no way are we going to help those Maya people down south. Uh, yeah, that's a real significant rhetorical shift. And I'm glad that you highlight that. And uh, for those who don't know, Christina and I wrote a piece in about 2004 called Leave the Balkans in Europe, which was a critique directed at Said Musa trying to say basically like, hey, Balk the Balkans are in Europe, leave them there, okay? The mountains in Belize are called the Maya Mountains. Let's talk about what's happening. Let's talk about what's happening in the Maya Mountains. Um, I I would say quite simply, Christina, that the what you're putting your finger on there is a political shift which reflects the closing of the aperture that I'm talking about in this paper. In other words, Said Musa was willing to do certain things in 1998 to 2000 that were much more difficult for him in 2004 to 2005. I'll just mention in passing that for those of you who are interested as I am in political history of Belize, that a lot of things changed inside that PUP government in those years. There's a lot of things that were accomplished in 98 to 2000 that I think would have been much more difficult in 2005 to 2006 as a result of internal conflicts within the party and also the changing economic fortunes of the society. I mean, there was a lot of money flowing into Belize and flowing around in 99, 2000, 2001. So they could do things like create niche, for instance, which we're enjoying the fruits of today that I don't think would have happened in 2006 or 2007 because of changes in vision, internal dynamics, and also political economy. So this is just one part of a bigger story about the change within the PUP during that period, which is a different conversation. But I, de I, I take your point, Chris, you're definitely right. Uh, I prefer the early Musa on this point uh, uh, by, by, by a lot. On the second point about the death of Julian and what, how that may or may not have, um, um, how can I put it? I mean, I think what I'm really hearing behind your question is whether there isn't evidence here of the plausibility of the hypothesis that Julian was murdered essentially to prevent significant change in Toledo. That was not my intention when I set out to do this research to try and establish that. Um, but I can understand why someone might take it that way. Uh, what I will, what I, the other thing I'm taking away from your second comment, Chris, is that, you know, you're pointing out in the spirit, like Filiberto's skepticism, like how far could we really have gotten in those days because we didn't have the court case behind us. And moreover, if we look at some of the people who would have had to execute that new policy, like Micah Spot and Johnny Briseño, they're the very people who in this paper, uh, they're the bad guys, so to speak. They're the ones who are holding up change. And I think that's exactly right. I think that it would have been a bitter struggle. This, this, there's, there's no scenario here where things would have been easy. It's just that it would have been a different struggle, if I could put it that way. And I, I, I think what I would do now is turn that reflection around and say, the unfortunate situation today is that we still have some of the more conservative anti-Maya land rights elements in power, but we don't have 
some of the ad advantageous circumstances that we did have in the 1990 playing in our favor. And of course, as you know better than anyone, the the the, the real strength of the movement today, apart from the the victory in the courts, is the is the grassroots mobilization, which in a sense, thanks to the work of you and others, is actually stronger and deeper today than it was in the 1990s. But everything is relative. It has to, you know, the political dynamics are complex. And in a way, with a little bit less mobilization, we were able to achieve more in the 1990s. Uh, but more on more on that perhaps in our time. Uh, to your question, and this is where I'll end, you, 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 about how to see opportunities in the present. I think that there's no simple formula here, but one of the reasons for engaging in this kind of historical discussion where we collectively reflect back is precisely because it reminds us that sometimes we don't see opportunities when they are present. And it's an attempt to kind of force us out of a perhaps familiar thinking routine that I bring this paper to you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you both for your input. Um, and I believe that there are some other questions in the chat. Uh, I see a question here from, um, oh, okay. Uh, before I get into the questions that are in the chat, I also see some questions in the chat that from some of our um, our participants that have their mic, their cameras on already. Uh, Richard Wilkes, I'm not sure if you would like to say your question out loud, if you'd like me to read it for you. Uh, but you can definitely join in on this discussion if you'd like. Thank you. Um, thank you, Niche, for uh, making this discussion possible. Um, and Joel, for um, sending his image all the way from Japan uh, in order to take part in this. Um, I just, I'm wondering um, when the Indian Law Resource Center got involved, because that seems to be um, at the tail end of your paper. Um, but it was a very crucial uh, time where the discussion went from politics to the courts. Um, and in talking with people involved with the uh, Indian Law Resource Center, I got the sense that they had other ambitions beyond just um, securing land rights for people in Toledo, uh, that this was a more uh, a part of a larger and more comprehensive strategy on their part. So, um, but I don't know, when did they get involved and how did they become so deeply involved? Great, great question. Uh, great to see you, Rick and Anne. Thank you for being here. Um, huge question and one which I hope to take up in a subsequent piece of research. I, I sort of reduced the story here because the paper was already getting too long. I want to acknowledge in passing that I saw before, I don't see it right now. My old friend Deborah Schaff is logged in here today. Deborah was the point person from the Indian Law Resource Center during the years in question. So um, uh, I, I, you're asking me a question that she's the expert on and she's here. But um, here's the, the, the short version. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the Indian Law Resource Center or ILRC is a nonprofit legal uh, center, uh, NGO based in the United States in Helena, Montana. And they were involved in the case of Southern Belize for around 15 years, beginning in the early 1990s. So well before the period under discussion here, Rick, circa 1992, Curtis Berkey first came down to Southern Belize. That led, as you I'm sure know, to the publication of his report on the status of the rights of indigenous lands in Southern Belize. Shortly thereafter, around 1994, Deborah Schaff became assigned to the case and started coming down to Southern Belize. Um, by 1995, she was uh, centrally involved in conversations with the leadership of the movement, and there's no doubt that the ILRC played an absolutely fundamental role in helping to increase the capacity of the movement in the mid-1990s, putting together the first lawsuit, which went to the Supreme Court of Belize, which you know about, uh, because your testimony played a central role in that, your research, uh, but also in the development of the Maya Atlas Project, the mapping of Toledo, and other projects. And so I, there's much to say about all this, but I will say the ILRC was therefore deeply involved before the period in question, and they were also a major actor during the conversations in 1999 that I referred to earlier. To be very blunt, I think that 
the the it, the lawyers working with the Maya leadership from ILRC in 1999 correctly assessed that in the wake of the passing of Julian, that the their their client was weak and divided. And it's pretty clear from the evidence that one of the reasons that they thought that that was a time to go back to court was it was a way of kind of keeping things together and building up capacity for a better position later on, right? You know, if you if you go to court and you win, then, you know, maybe in the next round, we'll be in a better position to fight and we'll have something behind us. And so the, the really critical decision was whether to push ahead and present the full materials to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the first time a major case from Belize had gone before the OAS legal system. And when that decision was made positively, then that became... You know, in a sense, like the major organizing work of not just ILRC, but of the movement's leaders for about two years. And um, that was something that the the Musa team uh, was fully aware of and was concerned about. They did not want to lose in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. They did lose. It's worth acknowledging we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the loss of Belize in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights which was the first major decision before Justice Conte's in favor of indigenous human rights. Incidentally, the language of the findings in the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights' decision is, is repeated almost literally again in the 2015 consent order. So the legal precedent for Maya land rights wasn't established with the consent order. If you want, if you want to say it this way, you could say it, it's been around for 20 years now. So Rick, in some... You know, I was part of some of those conversations as well. And my view was similar. It was like, yeah, why don't we go to the Inter-American Commission? We need to build up our case. <clears throat> but 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 I was more skeptical then about what might be achieved through um, a combination of political struggle and direct negotiations at that time uh, for reasons that I think have been aired out in this conversation. But in retrospect, I think that the, those circumstances were relatively speaking compared to all other points in Belizean history. Um, maybe the best we ever had. That's what. That's really what I'm trying to say. It, it, that's maybe a good way, and, and I'll finish my comments now and turn over the questions. Like, folks, if it sounds like I'm being Pollyannish and I'm saying, oh, we had it so great, it's all relative. The, what we have to remember here is there has never been a time when the government of Belize and the indigenous peoples really had great negotiations about land issues. And I don't think we're about to turn that corner. But there, there were perhaps one or two points in history where we can say, okay, well, things were maybe getting closer to better then. And that this was one of those times, I think the best of all times. Thanks. Wonderful. And I think that does answer some of the questions that are in the chat right now. So I will move things along. I see uh, Elma Kay has her hand up. Elma, could you put your mic on and maybe your camera if you're there so that we can um, engage in this conversation? Hi, everybody. Good night. You might not be able to see me well because of my lighting, but um, uh, Filiberto, Christina, lots of people I know. Nice to see you all. Um, Joel, thanks for the presentation to you and Filiberto um, for the discussion. I, I guess um, actually the period that you covered is exactly the period I was away <laughs> from home. Um, so I don't have any personal rec recollection of, of a lot of that, only what I would have gotten in the news. But I had two questions, and I guess they relate to sort of tactics that people in power um, often use in time in terms of, you know, sort of uh, going, th making things go in the direction they want to. And, and I guess the first question I have is during that time of the Musa administration, was there anything underlying the need for support in terms of the elections or in terms of the PUP consolidating its power that they really needed Toledo for? Um, and I, I'm just sort of trying to think if this wasn't like uh, some form of tokenism or you know some form of there was something behind um why it would have been and 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 as you said i mean it could have well just been a moment in time when 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 things were more aligned and and it could have happened but i just i'm always skeptical and i'm just wondering if there wasn't a reason why at that moment they needed that you know the pup needed that support in toledo um 
and then I guess my second question is, I think another one of the tactics that we're already seeing uh, being implemented now is the divide and conquer strategy, right? In all of these um, struggles that have sort of noble ideals, um, you will always have like the people that are that are in this struggle and then the people that see an opportunity for themselves to you know break away because it's, it's not convenient or they can negotiate a better deal or something like that and and i think one thing we shouldn't forget is that all of us are humans it doesn't matter if you're maya or whatever you are you know there's always as human beings there's propensities to rise to our better selves and there's still those um you know, that ability to sort of uh, go into our, maybe the, the selves we're not so proud of. Um, so the divide and conquer strategy is always used. And I, I guess my question to you as somebody that has covered some of these things in history is, you know, what does history show us when there are these struggles for sort of these ideals? Um, what does history show us in terms of those causes that are able to um to not fall prey to the divide and conquer strategies that i that i really see at play in 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 this um in this particular moment wonderful thank you for that wonderful question emma um on the first question about the importance of toledo and whether it was you know just a sort of cheap uh, political stunt or whether it was sincere. Um, I, I'll just notice, um, mention one or two things. If I went back and looked at all of those party documents that both parties prepare before each election where they promise what they're going to do for, for both parties since independence to the present day when I was writing this paper, to look at what every party had said about Toledo at each step. And I noticed that in 1998, the PUP party platform was the only platform in the history of post-independence Belize where either party had a special page in their platform about Toledo as a, as, as a problem, so to speak. And in fact, there were two pages in the 98 PUP platform, and it shows a picture of the rainforest getting bulldozed over and Maya people protesting. And then it has a series of promises, and it says things like, Toledo is the poorest part of Belize. The injustices there must be uh, confronted. Only the PUP can do it. And here's what we're going to do. And they lay out their promises. That was the only time that it happened. So then, so that's another piece of evidence that like, yeah, something different was going on. There was a discussion in the air about Toledo that was different then. So then the question becomes why? Like, what was it? it part of it is about party politics. As always in Belize, that's, that's always an element of the story, right? So I'll share with you just an anecdote or a fact, which is that of, if you if you go back even as, as early as the 1960s, it's noticeable that across Belize, Toledo has always been a problem for the PUP. Rural Toledo was essentially left out of the struggle for independence from England. Uh, rural Toledo, to make a generalization, most people were not actively committed to ideologically or subjectively a drive to, tr to get rid of the British. In fact, there was a lot of skepticism coming into 1981 about what this new group of leaders was going to do, specifically about the so-called Indian reservations. And in fact, in the early 1980s, once the PUP came into power on their own, uh, the, their lands department threatened to sweep away all the Indian reservations so they could claim all that land as national land and divide it up themselves. That was the spark that initially changed the Toledo Indian movement as it had been called into the TMCC. So the early roots of this struggle go right back to this kind of skepticism about the PUP. So the 98 platform and this attempt to sort of meet the leaders where they were re reflected a significant shift within the party. And I wanna emphasize here, a shift away from George Price. Now I know George Price is a national hero and all that kind of stuff, but look, I mean, he was never really seen as really strongly in favor of indigenous people in Toledo. I mean, so the idea that maybe we can negotiate with this new guy was something that was really uh, strong at that time. Toledo West, if you look at it, if you look at the history of Toledo West before 1998, it's almost always in the UDP category. So the PUP really wanted to win Toledo West, but there's a whole nother level to this, which goes beyond party politics, which is that in the mid 1990s, something unusual in Belizean history occurred, which is that we, I'll, I'll use we here because I was part of this. We had, a, we had an international campaign to embarrass the government of Belize for how badly it was treating the indigenous peoples of Toledo. 
And it really worked. I mean, Belize was getting hammered in the international media for chopping down the rainforest, for its ridiculous logging concessions, for abusing the rights of indigenous peoples. And the government of Belize was getting really affected by this. It was affecting things like the things tourists would say about the marketing strategy of the government of Belize. You know how important that is. Additionally, remember that the first case had been brought to the Supreme Court of Belize, and then it was looking like that was going to go to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, as it eventually did, as I mentioned earlier. So it looked like the government of Belize was going to get sued in international human rights courts over these issues. So for all of these reasons, Toledo wasn't just about winning an electoral ground that had been heretofore very difficult for the PUP, although that was a factor. But it was also about how do we neutralize this potentially damaging international embarrassment? Another example of this was that we had campaigns to hold up international loans from the World Bank, from the IDB, from the CDB, and so forth, for things like the paving of the Southern Highway and other works. So there was also a financial aspect to it. So for all these reasons, there were there were there were there was real interest on the part of the PUP leadership on hitting reset, so to speak, in their relationship with Toledo. There's a complicating factor in all this, which is I haven't said much about Toledo East which was Micah Spot's space then, as it is today, kind of unbelievably, how little that has changed. And Micah Spot was never really on board with this stuff. And I don't think he is now either. And so mm -hmm. that part that part of the story uh, remains to be told. As for the divide and conquer, can I turn that over to Philly? Because I've been doing so much speaking. Philly, what are we going to do about the ongoing attempts to divide and conquer people, which are so successful in Belize? <laughs> I mean, I have my thoughts on this, but I'd rather hear you speak about it. So I'm going to pass the mic to you. <laughs> well, that's too easy, Joe. I don't have an answer, but anyway, but before I go there, let me ask you a question. And that's the, the, the issue of the Guatemalan claim. I remember when Assad um, was engaged in negotiations, but I can't recall exactly when, but one of the first things that came out was actually a letter from the Maya leader stating that they considered themselves Belizean and that they're rejecting Guatemala. And to what extent that also played a role in terms of like, we have to really look after Toledo because Guatemala is claiming Toledo. And if you think about the projects also like TRDP and all of those that were implemented where Tumulcain is now, it also kind of happened kind of around a similar time, I think, if I'm correct. You know, there was like Guatemala activity going on, uh, independence is coming up. We have to invest in Toledo to make sure that it remains part of Belize. So, um, and you didn't talk about that in the paper. So I, suddenly I thought, oh, this is really interesting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sure. briefly, I, I did look at that and I didn't write about it because I came to the conclusion it was not a major factor. You, you are correct that there was a letter. There's been there have been more letters since. But it wasn't like in 98 when the PUP made these overtures that they thought, OK, if we win in Toledo and we, we give money and recognize indigenous land rights, then they'll really be great advocates for us on the Guatemalan question. Not at all. There's no evidence to suggest they had that strategy. And it wouldn't have been a great strategy because it wasn't really that decisive. Uh, it is worth acknowledging that it was during this same period of time, the first BUP administration, when the ball got really rolling in the direction of the differendum, which ultimately resulted in the vote in the favor of going to ICJ. So the roots of that success lie back in this period as well. But I don't think it was, I, I think the the concerns with Toledo were more direct. Look, let us let me put it more bluntly and more positively if I can. I think that the Maya movement of Toledo is without any doubt the most important and successful social movement in Belize since independence. I mean, there's a couple other really important social movements, but I just don't think we've seen anything else that has been as sustained as long, as radical in its vision, and as successful politically in advancing its goals over time. I don't think there's really any question that it's number one. And, you know, it's gone through its ups and downs like every social movement, but the mid 1990s were definitely an up period. And it really affected Belize's political um, landscape as a whole. And so the, the issues that we're responding to today are really a response to the, the success of the, the movement at that time. Right. In terms of the divide and conquer, the question that the Elma asked, I mean, I said, I don't know that I, I, I have an answer to the question, but I, I, I guess that um, it, it seems to me, so I don't know, I'm not sure at what level we respond to that question. Like, for example, uh, in terms of the different kind of movements of different sectors of Belize, 
Okay, so you have like an environmental movement, you might have the women's, you might have the indigenous peoples, and within indigenous peoples, you have Garifuna, you have Maya, and there's often kind of a divide and conquer of these different movements. I think I haven't seen a great degree of solidarity between all of these movements in terms of a common struggle. I think they tend to be very focused on their trying on what it is they're trying to win. So building those alliances uh, don't always happen. I, I don't I'm not too sure what to do about that. Um, I, I I do feel that sometimes we fail to see kind of the bigger picture, like what it is that we're struggling. And maybe sometimes we want um, everybody to, we, we tend to think that our movement is kind of the most important, right? And failing to see how our movement actually, um, they don't have to be the same, okay? But they certainly support each other. And I guess also, so so I'm going to move to something else, like the question of whether the POP was tokenistic or not. And I think, well, whether it was or it wasn't, in a sense, it may, as important as that might be, may not be as important um, as what we do with that. And from the other side, okay, if the POP is saying, or whoever it is saying, we're going to do this, even if they're tokenistic, how do we make use of that? Because we have to recognize that Obviously, uh, as Christina mentioned, the, 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 I think she did, governments or politicians are also limited. They have multiple demands, right? And uh, how do they respond to all of this? So I guess sometimes we expect that there's going to be like a purity on the side of politicians when I think that would be unrealistic. Okay, they are certainly not Maya movement. They're not on, th on this side fighting for uh, Maya land rights or for environmental uh, questions, right? Whatever that might be, they're on the other side. Um, I think recognizing what the limitations limitations they have and what might be possible to advance, I think, is is important without losing sight, of course, of the what it is that we really want to accomplish. Awesome! Uh, thank you both so much. There are so many questions uh, popping up in the chat, uh, and so I think I'll have to um, I'll have to open up the Q and A a little bit longer. We have some some persons here. Uh, I think this question comes from uh, Hugo Guerra, and he's asking, I believe, uh, you, Joel, what in your analysis has changed in the PUP from the 1997 to 2004 era to today's PUP administration era? So um, that's a big topic of conversation, and I might acknowledge that there are people on this call who are probably better placed to, to speak to it than, than, than me, but I'll give my short answer. It seems to me that the current administration is not serious about resolving the land issue. Uh, it, it, this, is, this is the reason why we've seen so little progress since the April 2015 consent order. Uh, the previous government was also not serious about it. Um, clearly the Caribbean Court of Justice and the judiciary in Belize do not have the capacity to compel the state, the cabinet in particular, to do what it needs to do, which is to pass legislation that recognizes for once and for all indigenous communal land rights. And not only that, but the state has uh, an interest in not resolving the issue, which has already been indicated by Filiberto. The state in Belize, going back to British colonial times, has always had as one of its fundamental interests control and regulation over the distribution of land in Belize. That's, that's a major crucial resource that state officials get to hold above the rule in order to sustain their capacity to rule. And the state doesn't want to give that up. Didn't Dickie Bradley say it beautifully recently on his, you remember his show? You remember? Sometimes you have to love Dickie Bradley because he just says these things and you're like, thank you for saying that in public. Um, I can't imitate Dickie, but you know what I'm saying? He said something to the effect of like, the government is not happy that the Maya people won in court and own their land. Because government always wants to control land and hold it above the people and say, oh, we'll give you 10 or 30 acres if you do X, Y, or Z, support me. That's the clientelism that Dylan Vernon has written so beautifully about that Philiberto mentioned before. No state's going to want to get rid of that power. That, incidentally, is the very thing that in his interview with me, Said Musa specifically said the then director of lands, Minister of Natural Resources, Johnny Brasenio, did not want to lose in 1999 to 2004, was that power. And, you know, why would any of us want to give that up if we were in charge of that? So um, that's something that Belizeans as a whole have a concrete interest in changing. 
this is not just a Maya issue. It seems to me that every Belizean, except for those who directly benefit from this process, including land owners or people who got land that way, have a real concrete material interest in transforming how the state manages land in Belize. And to move it in the direction of collective and community benefit would seem to be one of the fundamental needs of something like democratic progress in Belizean history. So in that sense, we can say that the Maya movement has done a great gift for all Belizeans by reminding everyone that you collectively have, a, have an interest in managing lands more democratically. So that doesn't all end up in the hands of 1% of the population and then they're not even paying taxes on it and the rest of it. So this is a real, uh, this is a real live issue. And coming back to the divide and conquer issue, I just wanna say one word about that. In this conversation today, we've mainly been talking about divide and conquer in terms of uh, uh, what we might call race or you know, the divisions between the Maya and other groups in Belize. To a certain extent, it's come up in terms of party politics, but there are many ways in which the social body is divided and people are played against each other. Think of religion and gender and so on. But I think one that often doesn't get enough emphasis in discussions about Belizean politics is social class. And that includes things like education and access to the state, social power, prestige, but also wealth, money. And the fact is that for, if we look at Belize historically as a class divided society, going back to the British colonial times, there's always been a kind of oligarchy of wealthy, powerful people that have dominated the state and who have no interest in sharing the land with the rest of Belizeans. They want to control that resource. So in seen through that lens, the, the story of what's been going on in Toledo since the 1990s looks like this. A group of poor agrarian people, let's call them peasants, got themselves organized and said to the state and the oligarchs in Belize, I'm sorry, you can't have this, this, this resource. We've been using it. We're going to use legal and political means to hold on to it. And they uniquely in modern Belizean history have succeeded in holding on to it. So here comes Dickie Bradley. And he's like, yeah, why do you think the state doesn't like that? They wouldn't like it if anyone did it. So uh, that's my thoughts on that. More, more questions? Uh, oh, I don't think I answered Hugo's question about the current administration. Yeah, no, the current administration is not serious about resolving these issues for reasons just discussed. Um, we would, pr I, 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 look, I think unfortunately um, the circumstances today, politically speaking, are not ripe for easily resolving the issue on the ground in Toledo. I'm more skeptical now than I was then that we're going to see uh, a fair and just resolution to the issue of lands. I think what we really need is a reinvigorated struggle for Belizeans' rights to land uh, in general, which, which could look like a people's struggle, uh, or if you would, a struggle for democratic socialism in Belize. I think the Maya, simply put, the Maya and the courts cannot be expected to do alone what is ultimately going to be a Belizean people's struggle. Um, there's a, a few more questions here. Uh... Dr. Wainwright, um, I don't know if you'd like to address some of them in the chat as we go, but we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, but I did particularly like this question uh, from Joanne, and she was asking about um, how is this issue related to other issues around the world, which I found very interesting. Um, she said, uh, how is this issue addressed in other parts of the world? What can be learned from the experiences, if you are, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're aware, uh, of the, with the Treaty of uh, Waitangi, I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that wrong, um, in New Zealand. Uh, Doc, any, any thoughts? I know um, Mr. Dr. Panadas also has some thoughts on this. But um, I would like to open the floor to, to you, Joel, if you have any thoughts, or to you, um, Billy, if you have any thoughts. So, the sure, the, the two cases that the Belize Maya case is most often compared to, if you look at the academic and legal literature, are the Awastigni case in Nicaragua and the Canadian cases like Delgamuk in, in British Columbia. And uh, for two different reasons, Awastigni, because it played out with very similar arguments in a reasonably proximate part of the world, uh, and in fact involves some of the same lawyers, uh, Jim and I, uh, uh, former special rapporteur for indigenous people at the UN was the lead lawyer in both of those cases. In a paper I wrote with a, a fellow geographer named Joe Bryan, we kind of compared and contrasted the way law and mapping was used in the Awastigni and Belize Maya cases. I'd be happy to share that with anyone if you're interested. Um, but the Canadian cases are, in a sense, legally uh, a more clean-cut point of comparison because, of course, 
British Columbia in particular, in Western Canada, the westernmost province of Canada, was colonized by the British in the second half of the 19th century. And so that's when the indigenous lands were plundered by the British and brought into global capitalism, et cetera. So the timing and the actors involved are very similar in the case of British Columbia and Belize. And so for that reason, when the attorneys put together the case for uh, Belize, there were many references to uh, law in Canada because the Canadians were, so to speak, a little bit ahead of Belize in terms of developing uh, legal um, uh, rights for indigenous lands. The, the Mabo case from Australia was also important. So the 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 Treaty of Watangi was not as significant and doesn't remain as significant. So now a huge generalization. Okay, so please note my waving hands. Uh, the courts have been have been getting better about recognizing indigenous land rights all across the Americas. We're seeing real progress. On the other hand, the progress has been very slow to actually translate those legal victories into concrete changes in terms of political economy and geography on the ground, not just in Belize. So this is a general pattern. The situation, I would say, in Awastigny today is materially worse than in Toledo. So, you know, what we're describing as difficult as it is, isn't necessarily the worst case scenario. Um, so the struggle continues. I mean, I think that one way to look at this is now we're at a point where, to put it positively, uh, indigenous peoples have reached a point in their struggle where we can collectively recognize we really need to reorganize politics, economics, and geography to bring more just forms of what we might call geographical and historical justice to communities that have suffered the violence of colonialism and its aftermath. On the other hand, uh, there aren't really a lot of great models for how to do that, uh, that, that look a lot like what we see in Toledo. The one that is closest to Toledo geographically and which seems in many ways to parallel to it is that of the Zapatista communities of Chiapas, which Filiberto has written about, for instance. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, however, if you, if you look at, up until recently, very few people compared and contrasted what was happening in Toledo with Chiapas, even though, you know, as the crow flies, it's, it's just a couple hundred miles away. Um, but, the, you know, the Zapatistas didn't reclaim their territory with attorneys. And they didn't do so by um, winning, you know, land back in the courts and then finding a way to negotiate with the government. They used armed struggle and seized territory and then reconstituted the communities within. Now, I'm not necessarily suggesting that armed struggle would have been the way to go in southern Belize. But I am saying that it's worth thinking about the different consequences that have played out in the last 30 years in these two communities that have so much in common. Incidentally, the legal option wasn't an opportunity, wasn't an available avenue for the Zapatista communities in the 70s and 80s because of the very different history that they had experienced under Spanish colonialism and the way that the empire in uh, the of the Mexican nation state colonized those communities. So uh, in sum, it's very hard to make as much, Hugo, as much as your question is a valid one, it's very hard to make really good, clear generalizations about where Belize stands in relationship to these other places, other than the, to recognize that apart from some very general parallels, each of these struggles has its own distinctions and its own its own uh, qualities, which which are shaped by history and geography and the social particulars of the place. And again, one other thing I would mention here, because I don't want let, to let class fall off this, is that a major factor in all this is that all of these communities, all the ones I just mentioned, are more fully inserted into global capitalist social relations today than they were 30 or 40 years ago when many of these struggles were really kicking off. And that has a major effect on the internal dynamics of the struggles. So, for instance, if you go to rural Toledo today, the villages are more internally class divided than they were 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. And that makes unification at the village level over issues like collective land use much more complex. So as, as one of my colleagues puts it, it's like throughout this entire period, you know, you have capitalism ripping apart the internal social cohesion of these communities. It's a little bit too simple to put it that way, because of course that's a process that really begins in the 19th century. But it is true that the, the depth of dependence and ties to capitalist social relations in the communities in rural Toledo is significantly uh, deeper today than it was in the 1990s, let's say. I think based on the fact that there's so many questions in the chat tells me that we did not allocate enough time for this topic. But I, yes, please go ahead, uh, Dr. Panados. Maybe can I can I add one thing? I mean, Joel, and thank you for ans answering that question. Um, another question was how does Belize compare with other countries and maybe how other countries are dealing with that. 
Um, sometimes it feels as if uh, Belizeans or here in Belize, you think that the, it's only in Belize that we're dealing with the question of indigenous land rights or indigenous peoples uh, challenges us to rethink the state, uh, to rethink our relationship with the land, uh, to rethink social relations. I mean, but I think this is happening all over the place, and you mentioned quite a few of them. Um, as I was thinking about the cases, for example, of Bolivia and Ecuador, where uh, indigenous peoples also made some inroads, and there was some opening, I think, from the state to incorporate uh, more of kind of indigenous thought into the constitution, uh, into kind of rethinking the 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 nation state. Um, I guess my point is that we're not the only ones dealing with this, and their countries have really done some interesting things. Um, with, of course, the results may not always be as how we would like them, but I think that uh, they've advanced uh, significantly. Definitely agree with you there, um, Benares, and I can can definitely say for certain with my experiences that whenever we bring up this kind of um, conversation or this topic, people tend to want to shy away from it. Uh, they don't want to talk about politics uh, in this particular light, and they don't want to talk about um, the differences in, in, in cultural approaches to certain topics. So whereby the people of the South have a different idea of what this particular topic looks like, persons in Belize City have a completely different idea of what this topic looks like, and it all comes down to education and um, who is providing that information, whether that be the media, whether that be certain uh, education institutions. I don't know if we've collectively gotten the information standardized to a point that says, hey, this is the issue. What do you think about it? Or how much do you know about it? So I think until we get to that point where we can have this conversation openly, we're going to continue having these kinds of, I guess, divide and conquer conversations, if you will. But I want to ask this last question, because, and, and please, um, Professor Wainwright, Dr. Panados, if you all can um, assist me with looking at some questions in the chat so that we can close our session for this evening, that would be great. But Final question comes from Osmane Salas and um, says here, thank you, Joel and Philip, for your paper and response, respectively. My question is, what now? How do we move forward? How do we create a new aperture? In my opinion, a big part of the problem is that the general public is not educated about the issue. There is a new generation around that no clue and uh, the politicians thrive in the ignorance among the people so who wants to tackle that one first not sure. <laughs> um how do we bring another aperture i i don't know that i can answer the question I mean, it's something that i'm thinking about for example by, with participating in toledo and maybe more than bringing about another aperture, certainly I think social mobilization is critical to, to that, okay? But I think also being kind of open to the opportunities um, is, I think it's, it's really something that I'm, I'm, having read Joel's paper has made me think, okay, where are those opportunities um, that we might be able to act? Um, those are kind of my limited thoughts really on the on the question. So thank you, uh, Asmani, for a great question. It's great to see you there again, comrade. I Look, I, I, I let me come at this question from a little bit of a different perspective. I recently wrote a completely different paper about the women's movement in Belize, or the what we call the feminist movement, even though that's not always what it was called by itself, uh, which you may recall really took off in the 1970s, peaked in around the mid-1980s, and then went into a kind of a terminal decline in the early 1990s. I say we, I wrote this with a former student of mine named Rachel Bruno, and we got some feedback on the paper that was sort of similar, like, fine, okay, it's interesting to talk about the history of social movements, but what now? And um, when confronted by those sorts of questions, I'm always tempted to say, well, the lesson is that, you know, the struggle continues and we have to keep going. But I think what, what you're really asking is, like, what specifically do we take from this specific kind of research that might clarify how the struggle continues today? And here I would say actually that my conclusion from both of those research papers that is looking at the rise and decline of the feminist movement and the rise 
and the falling short of the indigenous rights movement in the 90s, which by no means has gone away in the same way, is that um, I don't think any um, social movement in Belize that's organized around the demands of a specific group of people, be they Maya, Garifuna, women, et cetera, is likely to succeed unless it is joined by multiple other social movements, which are also radical and which also come to the fore at around the same time in history. And the reason for that is, unless we see multiple social movements challenging the organization of politics and economic life in Belize at around the same time, we're not going to arrive at a conjuncture socially conducive for significant social change, let alone a revolution. So that is to say, the good news here, I suppose, Osmani, is you don't have to move to Toledo and join the Maya in their struggle to make a major significant contribution to the achievement of their goals. What we would have to see is the active leadership and participation of many more Belizeans in the building of what I would call grassroots-based mass mobilization with specifically uh, left-wing goals, by which I mean collective liberation and emancipation and equality. Unfortunately, if, I think a frank assessment is that we've seen very few such things since independence, partly because of the very conservative hegemony of cultural life and intellectual life in Belize, partly because of the weakness of civil society organizations, partly because of the of the defeat of the labor movement multiple times in Belizean history, partly because of the way independence was arrived at in its delayed form and the way that the arrival of independence was not experienced as a collective achievement of the Belizean people. And of course, they were divided over the Guatemala question thoroughly by 1981. But with all that said, the struggle always continues. And so I would say um, whether regardless of who you are or where you are in Belize, the opportunity is always there to uh, to try to confront the limitations of your own thinking as I have tried to do in reflecting on this period and to radicalize your thinking further. And then most importantly, take the next step and find other colleagues and comrades and friends in your community with whom you can work and get organized and begin struggling for a better, fairer and more emancipated beliefs. That's always uh, the agenda. Yes, and maybe that's definitely. a good place for me to end. I'll, I'll leave that as my last word. Maybe. <laughs> well, can... I was going to ask for concluding remarks from both yourself and um, Dr. Penados, but if you're going to leave that as your concluding remark, I will take it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, with that said, I would like to ask Rolando to close us off another, I think, successful research lab series. Um, but I know you wanted to, to end with that note, uh, Joel, but for those of us that are in the chat that would like to read the article and so forth, um, yeah, just maybe a link or how they can reach you. Uh, there are several students that are watching that I know still have um, pending questions. So just just so that they can have that for for your for their convenience and their reference. All right, Rolando, take us away, close us off for this evening's um, from this research lab series. Um, thank you, April. Um, uh, for those who do not know, April Martinez is our living heritage officer at ISER, and there's several others from our team on this on this call, and I appreciate them sincerely, as well as my other colleagues within the National Institute of Culture and History. I take great pride in. Um, having participated in the session and thank many thanks to Dr. Joel and Dr. Filiberto uh, for agreeing um, to this arrangement, but also for the audience. I'm, I'm quite surprised um, how many of you have remained on this call and, and very much grateful as well to the scholars, um, activists, um, institutional leaders, as well as the educators and students that are on this call. We sincerely appreciate your participation they say that a good research paper leaves more questions than answers. And, and so, so far, Doc, your, your paper was a good one. There are many more questions um, that were raised and we appreciate um, the, your, your time and involvement to produce that research, but also to have participated in the movement um, sincerely. Thank you very much. Um, we are looking forward to another fourth edition and we're still confirming who that presenter will be. Um, but please keep us on your um, listing. You will be getting an update from us. Um, you can also keep in touch with us uh, via email um, at isr at nichepolice.org or remain in touch with us on social media channels like the YouTube channel or the Facebook channel. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wainwright and Dr. Pinados, um, and for April for being our MC, and to all the participants, especially those who took uh, the time to pose your questions. I'm sure that we can continue this discussion, hopefully in person, if not um, over email. Thank you very much.